is how I love you. Here I am before you, longing to be close to know you more. Hear the cry of my heart, the struggle to surrender. Come and take your place, take every part. can bring it a little closer, yeah. So good to be back again, even if the circumstances are, of course, joyous and um, Mikey dying. Um, but at the same time, it's a joy to, to praise God for people that go into, into his presence. And uh, the joy to meet you today again, friends, brothers and sisters. Since I was here, I have celebrated 50 years. Can you imagine? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm much older. <laughs> but it was 50 years since I experienced the Holy Spirit in my life. For the first time. I knew about the Holy Spirit, but I was convinced, being a part of the Lutheran Swedish Church, that uh, that thing the baptism or the filling of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit happened when I was born in, the, in my child baptism. So uh, at the age of 20, so I'm, getting, I'm going to 70 just in a few weeks, and that is interesting. You can pray for that because this, the number 70 sounds very old, right? <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, I discovered that God wanted more in my life as a student. And I was sure since I was 16, when I preached the first time, I came to the Lord when I was 15, 14, 15, uh, in confirmation. I'm so thankful for the church for, for pointing to Jesus for me. Uh, anyway, I hadn't met the Holy Spirit personally. So I was at this boarding school uh, and uh, we were studying hard to prepare ourselves for ministry and being a priest in the Lutheran church. But one night we were out uh, eating pizza or whatever, just sharing life, enjoying life. It was much good that happened. And, um, but there was a hole in my commitment in, in my um, discipleship as a follower of Jesus. And suddenly, you know, when the Spirit comes, 
he also speaks the truth. And Jesus said, it's good that I leave you, otherwise the Holy Spirit will not come to you. And when he comes, he will speak about truth. And the truth was that I made some compromises uh, in those days. So I, I started, and the other three that was around the table, they started sharing about the compromises we all have made. And suddenly, our sin became obvious. We were there to prepare ourselves to go out in churches and into streets, whatever, and share the good news about Jesus. But we had started compromising things that was not okay. Maybe not too bad, but it was not okay. So in the period of, say, two months, we started praying together and we started sharing our sins and we confessed our sins and we started reading about someone said you need the Holy Spirit and I said yeah but I do think I got it when I was baptized as a child but anyway I just realized that whether that was true or not I needed more so I was going for God and he said you know what Hans you spoke badly about this person and he showed me this man I saw him vividly and I knew exactly what he had said about me so God said you know you, you need to go to him and you need to confess your sins and ask forgiveness and I went to his room there was a boarding school and I knocked at the door and I tried to say to the door well you should have heard what he has said about me <laughs> And God said, you know what, I know that. But it's not about him, this is about you. You have to do this. So he opened the door and I said, I'm, my friend, I'm sorry. I, I, I spoke badly about you, would you forgive me? And he, and he did. And, and those kind of things happened over the month, for two months time. And we started praying together. And finally one day, the 6th of November, 1972, we came together and someone has read this old book, nowadays old book, about charismatic re renewal and the Jesus people. And it was about speaking in new tongues, it was about nine o'clock in the morning. And we studied those books and, and suddenly we realized we need to receive the Holy Spirit. I needed to be baptized or at least deeply filled with the Holy Spirit. That was my need. But how do you do that if you are in a church setting that is very clear? This is the kind, those kind of prayers when you lay hands on each other, that's for bishops and vicars, maybe priests, maybe pastors, but not for lay people. So one evening we decided, tonight is the night where we're going to pray laying on hands. And sure enough, we started praying, but then after two hours, no one knew exactly how to do this, how to administer the laying on hands. So I, <laughs> I was sitting in the very corner in a very large room, and I said, God, God, this is ridiculous. You can do anything. I, I submit myself. Whatever it takes, I'm willing to do whatever. You, you just come and fill my whole, my, my, my soul, my spirit, my body. I, I need you. And you know what happened? And God this, does this uh, personally. He doesn't go after, uh, you know, first po different points. But for me it was important to really experience the beauty and the holiness and the love of God. So I was sitting there and suddenly this, you know, energy maybe took me into the very middle of the room. I had no idea how I actually came there. But the, the, the light of God, the fire of God was just coming over me, filling my body. And I knew only one thing, that Jesus is real. He sits at the Father's right hand and He's in control of everything. 
And the first teaching I had about spiritual gifts was that God doesn't do these kind of things these days. He ended healing people, restoring people, uh, speaking, uh, speaking in tongues and prophesying was wrong. So I, I had to change my theology because on, on that journey from that uh, place to the very midst of the room, I suddenly started speaking in tongues. And I realized this is totally wrong or it's right and I was wrong the whole time. And I knew it was God. And I was so thankful. I will never forget, you know, the, 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 the pleasures of God. That, that he would show someone like me and just fill me, answering my prayer, cleaning me, filling me with joy, with life. It just changed my life totally. Anyway, so we celebrated with a cup of coffee in the midst of the night. We had been praying two hours, one o'clock or something like that. So now we're going to pray for the second guy. So we laid hands on him and he fell to the floor and I'm totally certain he is dying before my eyes. <laughs> so I said, God, heal him, restore him, bring him back to life. And he did. He was just faint, fainting because he was, I'm guessing he was extremely tired. But he came back and four days later when he woke up that morning, he woke up speaking, praising God in tongues. And then, of course, we were a little cautious now with the third guy. <laughs> so we had a cup of coffee or tea, and then we lay hands on him. And as soon as we touched him, he started speaking in tongues and, and gave an interpretation about what God was going to do in that school. And 50% of the students there got born again. They were filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit. They started moving in, in spiritual gift. It totally changed the dynamics of the school and our relationships. And most of the, these people are missionaries, social workers, uh, pastors, preachers, uh, priests, whatever. They gone into ministry because that few months of the revival changed their lives. And it was the Jesus people. So we started praying together and we started going out on the streets and we started traveling around sharing. You know, we have to share what we've been given. So we try, tried it and we laid hands on people and God came and healed and restored and, and lifted people up. So when Chris says, you know what, for those years, and this was even before that, we saw people all the time being touched by God and, and have their lives changed. And that was the gospel that, that I was, you know, trained into. Uh, and, and of course, has led me to this place. So anyway, so we celebrated that. Uh, and uh, I, I used the time to tell my church about all these stories and with modern technology I was able to, to catch up <coughs> uh, with one of my dear friends in Sweden, the vicar. So he was on Zoom sharing with my church about what, what God was doing because he was not in that room, he was sleeping in the room next to us. And he said, when I met him in the morning, he said, Hans, I haven't slept the whole night because God was in my room with the Holy Spirit. And I've confessed every sin that I possibly could have done <laughs> my whole life. He went through my whole life. And when something happened there in the room, you know, when I was moved, there was a, there was a, a sound, a sound or a crash or something and the Holy Spirit came on me. So, so he was touched by the Holy Spirit and that's the way it, it went from room to room. So we celebrated that and then a few days later um, I, I met a friend uh, because after this I, I was baptized and, uh, and, and with me was this man. And, and we haven't really spoken for nearly 50 years. We met each other occasionally in different pastor settings. He's a pastor, but he was baptized the same day. So we said, now after 50 years is the time to celebrate what God's been doing in our lives. 
So we met in my home, uh, in my city, and we spent uh, three, four hours just speaking about what God has been doing, how great we are, grateful we are for Him, to Him for what He's done, but also. The, the goodness of God, you know, uh, giving us families, giving us ministries, opening doors. We, we had a fantastic day sharing our history with God. I can just encourage you. You don't have to wait until you're 50 years old being born again or filled with the Spirit. Just use the occasion sometimes just to share what God has done in your life. Because as we sing these songs, it just brings forth so many good memories. How God has touched me, how He has touched other people, and, and how He's touching people today. So we need the stories, we need the histories. So please continue to tell them. Well, I have uh, not only some words that I want to share with you, I also have a word from my wife. And she called me before I was leaving uh, Heidi and Rodney's home, and she said, I think that you should pass on this to the church. Joshua 1, 1 to 9. In that, please note that and read it when you have time. But in that, th there is a special message for the Israelites as they are under the new leader, Joshua is going to enter the promised land. And God says, do not fear. I have a plan for you. The plan is this, you go there. And you put down your feet, and in every feet, I mean every foot you put down, that land is yours. All of it is yours, but you have to enter it, and you have to take it. And Lotta said, pass on. God has a plan. He has a plan. Maybe the plan is that you have to take a step at a time, but he has a plan. So now I've pro given you that, okay? You're sure one. Yes, and I think it's very, very important for all churches, but now for your church. This is a time where we are entering a landscape, not uh, that we haven't been in, how should I say, put this, which we haven't been walking in before. So we need to trust God that He will lead us by His Holy Spirit. So I think it's very appropriate. This is a, many Christians I feel are looking backward, like I was telling you the story about 50 years. <laughs> and it's glorious to think what God has been doing. But even as I turned 70, you know, I think that the most important part of my journey until I meet Jesus is going to be ahead of me. Amen. And this is going to be the most fantastic time. Maybe most challenging, maybe most hard, maybe most... You name it. But it will be the best time. And this is the best time for the church to be there. Because we need the people of God to, to walk together. To be a church family. And to bring forth good news to the culture we live in. And we can say, okay, it was better in the days of the Wesleys and the Methodists, of course we can say that. And maybe it also was better. But it doesn't help to say we have to go back. We have to say, God, with their help, with their uh, obedience to you, their love to you, we want to do, have that same in our heart, but we will go to our culture and speak the word of God. And that will change the future. This is the word I was thinking I was going to. You know, Paul, the old Paul, is giving us his, his heart. And in Ephesians, um, some theologians, they say that, that Paul is writing from a maybe symbolic uh, mountain where he looks at history, salvation history. And his two great messages that he thinks that he needs to pass on to the church. And, and that is reconciliation and the beauty of the church, what God is going to do through the church. 
And he, he starts with this. He say, he's saying, you know what? You're not cast out lonely in creation without uh, a past or a future. You are meant to be because God chose you even before creation. He chose you. He wanted you. He created you. Not only you as an individual, he, he meant your marriage, your family, he meant Britain, he meant Sweden, whatever nation we come from. He is in control of history. He knows exactly what is going on and he has a salvation history, that's what Paul is saying. And he is going to fulfill his promise and his decision to bring forth a holy people. That's the bride of Christ. And as pastor you can sometimes think, at least I do, are you sure Paul? Are you sure you're going to, that this is going to be the reality one day? And then I have to go back to Ephesians and say, yes, Paul, you are sure and the Holy Spirit made you write these things. So God is sure. The Holy Spirit is the seal that promises that what God has done in Christ, because here Paul says, in him, in him, in him, there is redemption, there is forgiveness, there is a plan. And he's going to make you holy. You will stand before him as an individual, but even more importantly, maybe the, the people of God will stand before him. And there will be no division, no walls, he says, in between, even between Jewish Christians or, or heathen Christians with a heathen meaning background or Jewish meaning background. It will be no division between people. Everyone will be included. All kind of human you know, segregation will be brought down and there will be one people in unity praising God. That's what Paul is saying. And then he adds, think, maybe he's thinking on his mountain. I'm not sure that the Ephesians will understand that because if you continue to read in Ephesians, you will find that he says, some of you are still stealing. You maybe should, should stop doing that. You understand? You're shoplifting or whatever they did. Stop doing that. It's not okay. <coughs> you remember? Okay. They were not as holy as you would imagine. They needed to repent. They needed to change. But that doesn't take away that God's plan is going to be fulfilled. He has given the Holy Spirit to his people, to individuals. And he's saying, that is a seal. That is a promise. It's a guarantee, I think was the wording, right? Guaranteeing that he will fulfill what he has promised. And, and uh, Chris reminded me that um, one of the fathers in the church of Wimber, the founder of the vineyard and maybe influencer of New Wine and you know, those kinds of, of groups, um, he, he made it a plan in his life that, that he would know Ephesians word by word just to remember how God speaks a promise. This is what Paul sees in the end of his life. He sees reconciliation, he sees redemption, he sees salvation history, and he says, that's where you come from. That's your real history from God's plan from eternity that he will bring forth a people that will worship him together with the angels and seraphims and cherubims, whatever they are named in heaven. Every creature will worship God. God will. He will succeed. There is no way salvation history is not going to be fulfilled. And because of that, you and I are called, and we as a church are called to go out on the streets to our neighbors, to the students we study together with and the workers we meet or elderly people that come together for a cup of coffee. We need to give them the good news and tell them this is really good news. I know where you're coming from. You're coming from God. I know why you're here. There's a meaning in your life. I know where you're going. You're going to meet Jesus soon. Are you ready for that? 
We have good news. You can come to know him even now and have eternal life. And as you meet him, he will speak to you and say, Well done, son. Well done, daughter. You are welcome. We have a wonderful message. And over these days, Chris and I, we have been speaking out, out of this experience with, with the, the funeral of, of Michael. Mikey. Hearing that Thanksgiving service, and seeing all these people singing these beautiful songs about heaven and, and the love of God to, to his church and to individuals and knowing out of all these things where people spoke about the, this uh, man of God this heart was for Jesus he knew why, why he was here he was satisfied with his life he knew why, why he was on earth to preach the good news and that's why you and I are here too that's our main purpose, to love him, to worship him, to enjoy him, and to share him with other people. And you know what? We live in a territory, both in Britain and Sweden, where people don't even know that Jesus has existed. They don't even know who Jesus is. They never heard about him. And you think, well, Britain and Sweden, that is Christian nations. And when I meet the immigrants in Sweden, they say, well, you are a Christian nation. No, I'm not so sure about that. I would assume that a Christian nation means that everyone knows who Jesus is and what is done and why he came and what it means in God's salvation history that the Son of God gave his life that the wrath of God will be taken away and I will be forgiven and I welcome to God you know that's good news but it seems that secular society is more and more focused on the, the small uh, perspective that humans have what, what, what's in it for me can I have a good cup of coffee? That's important for me, but in reality, if someone said, you have to choose Jesus or coffee, I would choose Jesus. <laughs> Just to give you an example. <laughs> oh, of course, you know I'm joking. But, but still, that kind of questions comes. So when we are out on the streets, as we were just part of for a short time yesterday on the prayer uh, shares, we also out and we serve people coffee and they speak with us and, and they always ask questions, especially men like 50 years old, 60 years old, they ask questions. Why on earth are you giving away coffee or a bun or whatever, donut, whatever we give them? And so we, we do it as a small token of the love of God, the love God has for you. And they say, well, why would you give it for free? And, and can you imagine, men, successful men, maybe rich, whatever, they look at us, and, and some men look at us with sadness in their eyes and they say, no one, can you imagine, no one has ever given me anything. I never received anything for free. One day, we were standing out and we were serving some pancakes, uh, some, something to eat and then we had table, it was nice weather which is not happening every day <laughs> so uh, this was summertime and, and uh, there was a group of people coming <clears throat> businessmen with suit and they came just from a meeting and, and we gave them some pancakes and some coffee and they sat down and, and ate and had a good time and we s spoke with them and, and when they were ready to leave this Swedish man come up to us and he says, uh, excuse me, they, they also tr really tried hard to pay for the pancakes. He said, I, I want to pay. I, I can do it, yeah. But we, we see that you can do that. But we are not willing to receive anything. We want to give this for free. It's just a token of God's love. It's for free. So they tried to pay and said, no way we're going to receive money. This is for free. The gospel is for free. It's good news. And the best in life is for free. Right? So, the man, the Swedish man comes up to us and says, I need to tell you. Thank you for today. You see, we have been in a business meeting for eight hours. These guys are Americans and they, they have, you know, how, how do you push it? The message to us. 
you have to realize, the businessman said, nothing in life is for free. And that was a message for eight hours. So we just walked away to take a long walk and go to a restaurant and have a meal. And the message of today was nothing is for free. And you, did, you totally denied the right for us even to pay for some pancakes. We got the message. The best in life is for free. Amen. And he was thankful. <laughs> he really enjoyed that. And we've seen this over and over. What, what does it do? Just imagine that you're 55 years old, you're a successful businessman, and no one has ever given you anything. No one has ever given you anything. I'm not sure that's true. Maybe as a child you got a Christmas present. I don't know. But, but just imagine that that's your life experience. And now you started thinking about what will happen when I retire. Guessing that broken families, kids, We've got away with a wife and now you live maybe in this large apartment or house, whatever, but there is nothing. They need good news, as anyone, everyone else. And the good news is, for free, God has done this and He's departed His Holy Spirit in us. Okay, let me take you to Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Do you have strength to listen a little more? Yeah. The answer should be yes. yes. <laughs> you have the microphone. I have the microphone. <laughs> I'm quite strong, even if I'm old. <laughs> and fight for it. And I was in north of Norway speaking at the Baptist church. And the Baptists in Norway, they love the Bible. So they said, we want you to have seven Bible studies and preach uh, services over this weekend. And when it finally came to the seventh, uh, my brain was washed and hot and I didn't think and I didn't notice about time. I was just preaching. As I promised seven times, I will do the seventh also. And, and time went away. <laughs> so finally the pastor stood up. Can you hold this? And he did, he did like this, you know, ice, ice hockey, hockey. Yeah. He said, he said, this is enough, he said. So I said, amen, and I prayed. I was happy to be helped out of that situation. And these elderly two ladies, they were ashamed of their pastor's behavior. So they came up and said, Hans, Pastor Hans, I, I, we are so sorry. I said, Don't be. My brain was out. Yeah, I, I think I preached one hour when he stopped me. So. <laughs> okay, that's not going to happen today. Acts 2, verse 1 to 4. Can someone read this? Maybe you again. It was perfect. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were. <coughs> they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in, in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. As the Spirit enabled them, sorry. Amen. And they... As they came to the census, they went out to the streets. And the whole of Jerusalem gathered outside because this was the day of Pentecost when God was going to fulfill His promise that every believer, woman or man, Jewish or heathen, old or young, or young rich or poor, whatever, all of them would receive the Holy Spirit. Right? He promised that through Joel 700 years earlier. Now it was fulfilled. And it's three text that is actually speaking about God pouring out the Spirit in different settings, cultural settings. This is the Jewish one in Jerusalem. And then in chapter 8 you find the Sumerians. And in chapter 10 and 11 it speaks about the heathens, the Romans, where um, Peter goes to Cornelius' house. Now, I would like to challenge you. 
Uh, if you have time today, tonight, or tomorrow, whenever is a good time for you, please remember to go to this text, Acts 2, the whole chapter, chapter 8, chapter 10 and 11, and read them, all four. And just check out, this is the question, what is the Holy Spirit doing as he presents the presence of the future? Meaning, when heaven invades earth, finally, when history is over, what does the Holy Spirit do to sh show us how the future looks like? Now we have looked into Ephesians and seen what God has been doing. Now I want us to look at what the Holy Spirit is doing as he is birthing the church. And he invites them to, to see how does the future in heaven, the reality in front of God, what does it look like when the Holy Spirit makes that obvious, present in their midst? That's a good Bible study, but let me hint at some things. It says that tongues of fire came on the disciples. Tongues of fire came. It was a wild sound because God, the Holy Spirit, was moving. It says that they started speaking in tongues so they could actually communicate the glory, the praise of God, who Jesus is to people. And if you follow uh, the text uh, a few verses down, you can see that, that uh, Peter is standing up defending uh, what they are doing because they went out preaching to the people, not knowing these languages. They went out and speaking it because now um, the judgment all over Babylon, um, Babel is, is over. Now people will understand through the Spirit what God is speaking to people. Amen. The judgment is over. The Holy Spirit is sent out. And you and I are able to go out and say, is that happening today? Well, a friend of mine, 18 years old, he was so much on fire. He wanted to go to Albania. And these were in the old days when it was communist system. And, and the president of that nation, he said, this nation is the first atheist nation. No one believes in God. And he felt God told him, 18 years old, you need to go there. So he went there. And as he was realizing, he was going to meet people the next day. He said, God, tomorrow I need to know the language they speak in Albania. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking, but he was maybe busy uh, evangelizing. So he's in Albania, Tirana, and he's going to meet people the next day. And he can't speak the language, and they can't speak Swedish. Or, or even a good English because it was a close country at that time. So he prays and you know what? The next day he wakes up speaking fluently Albanian. <laughs> Can you imagine? I had a prayer that your job till tomorrow is to listen to God and hear what he's saying and maybe you will have a dream and, and one of the girls came down and she says you know what Pastor Hans I, I had a dream last night she was 18 years old just newly Christian and she said I had a dream I, I dreamt that the whole school were going to this area where the communist is ruling and, and that's dangerous we were going as a team and I was thinking this is great that I can go there but suddenly there is this <coughs> Marxist and they have the machine guns and they stop the bus and all of us were supposed to go out in the dream so we did and, and eventually they said you have to turn around the bus and go back to Kathmandu and stay there but I was the last one and as I entered the, the bus Jesus stood in the bus and he looked at me and he said who said that you could go back? You are meant to stay here and to go into this area and preach the good news. And she's standing there, joyful. God has spoken. She had a dream about her, her future. And then she says, What do you think that means? 
Just think about that. It means that most probably, at least, at least that was my first thought, she's going to be a martyr. She's going there and preaching, maybe not, hopefully not, but maybe. These guys, they don't play. So what could I tell her? Well, I answered as honest and as godly as I could, but I realized God wants her to go and give a life for him. Who am I to stop that? In my church at home, would I say the same if, if a friend's daughter would come and say, 18 years old, I think I should go to North Korea and preach, something like that. Pastor Chris, what would you say? <laughs> no, it's a hard one, you realize that. But God has spoken, and she was so glad that God has spoken. So that was you know, that kind of week where God spoke and God healed. And, and this man came to me and he, he said, I, I want to pray for you. He was like an Old Testament prophet, like Elijah or someone. So he came and he was walking like this the whole week, praying for people. A little strange, but more like a prophet from the Old Testament. So he's coming and he said, I want to pray for you, Hans. So he laid his hands on me. And he prayed, I guess, for half an hour. He just prayed that God would fill me with his spirit, that I would be bold, that I wouldn't be scared, that I would be on fire for Jesus. And, oh, it was amazing. And, you know, you just sense the burden of God and you just go down on the floor and say, God, I want more of you. But I realized this is for real. Because I knew the man since I had conversations with him. And... Okay, uh, and he, he told his story. He said, I, I just came to the Lord and my village hated that I came to the Lord. So some of the men in the, in the village came, came after me and they kicked me and they boxed me and I was more or less dead. But my family came after me and they took me to their home. And in three days, without sleeping, they prayed and they prayed and they fasted and said, God, you have to wake him up. And, and he waked me up. And <clears throat> I, I wasn't healed in my brain. I, had, I was so damaged. So for three months, I was walking in the woods around my, my village. But then God came and healed me and sent me to this Bible school to be trained. I said, what are you going to do? And said, I'm going back to my village. They need to hear about Jesus. That's the kind of, you know, apostolic things that goes on and it goes on and it goes on because he's worthy of that kind of commitment. Now, here they speak in tongues. I will just end soon. Chapter 8, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We speak in tongues, chapter 8. Change lives is the secret. Chapter 10. It's about heathen can be part of God's family. Anyone can be part. Whoever you are. But there is a secret in the kingdom of God, and that is, it seems like when God starts to move, that the needy people will be the first one who comes. And we have to be prepared. That there's a need to be prayed for maybe every day until it happens and they start going out. Okay. Thank you. Now it's time to stop. Shall we stand up? Jesus, how I love you. Here I am before you, longing to be close to know you more. Hear the cry of my heart, the struggle to surrender. Come and take your place, take every part.
oceans deep this mystery how wide long and how high how deep how deep this love that covers me oceans deep this mystery how wide long and how high how deep and how wide is your embrace how long the road you walk to bring us home how high the price you paid and how deep the love you show may my heart find security in knowing i am loved eternally and how wide long and how high how deep your love for me and how wide is your embrace how long the road you walk to bring us home how high the price you paid and how deep the love you show and how wide is your embrace how long the road you walk to bring us home how high the price you paid and how deep the love you show
Jesus, how I love you. 